Welcome to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Hi guys, we've got a really interesting show for you. It's a bit special today. We've got an interview with my friend Radoslav Albrecht. Radoslav is the founder and CEO of Bitbond, and uh, he agreed to come and get interviewed and be on our show. Uh, it's an interesting way to kick off the fall season this Friday, September the 1st. How are you doing, Neil? I'm doing fantastic, Nathan. Can't wait to hear this interview again. I was uh, checking out over the weekend. Great stuff. We intend to have more interviews going into the fall. We've already had a number of people write us at info at analysisandchains.com and ask, hey, can uh, we be on your show? Can you interview us? And we're looking at those opportunities right now. And if you are interested in uh, coming on our show, uh, you can send us an email and we'll, we'll at very least take a look at it and maybe you'll have a chance to, uh, uh, to come and do an interview with us. Anything else to add, Neil? Um, no, not at this uh, moment in time. All right, and away we go. Now it's time for an Analysis in Chains exclusive interview. All right, this is a new section for the Analysis in Chains podcast. We're really excited today to have Radoslav Albrecht with us, the founder and CEO of Bitbond, the very first small business loan company operating in Bitcoin. Radoslav, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So I don't know if you've had a chance to hear our other analysis in chains podcasts, but uh, the way we usually do it is we talk about uh, developments in the blockchain community, make predictions, analyze what's going on. And uh, what I thought we would do with you today is talk a little bit about what you see as uh, being the opportunities, especially in the lending industry, what you're doing specifically, and then move into making our own predictions and seeing if they come true. Does that sound good? Great. Sounds like a great approach. All right. So tell me a, tell me a little bit about how you got started with Bitbond. Like how, how did you come to this idea of using Bitcoin for SME lending? Sure. So the original idea was to start a cross-border lending platform. And this was round about the year 2011 when there were already quite a few online lending platforms up and running like Lending Club, for instance, which today still remains the largest peer-to-peer -peer lending platform in the world. Um, lending Club is based in, in the US. And if you want to get a loan through Lending Club, you have to be a resident in the US. And also all retail investors are based in the US. Some of Lending Club's institutional investors are from outside the US, but um, like for the, for the retail user, you've got to be based in the US. And this was true for other platforms as well in the in the online lending space that they were just operating in one market. And and I really liked the concept of peer-to-peer -peer lending, but I thought it's a pity that you cannot actually lend money to people from other countries and as a borrower that you cannot borrow money from people from all over the world. And so I started to look into that and was analyzing why this didn't exist and was looking for a way to start such a cross-border lending platform where people could lend and borrow money from and to each other across different uh, continents and across different countries. And one big obstacle that I ran into was efficient remittances. So let's say we have a borrower from Brazil who gets funded by somebody from Canada, Germany, Australia. Then if all these people send money from the country to Brazil, then they have to pay fees for transferring the money. Then there are fees to convert the money from different currencies into Brazilian real. And the whole process takes a long time. And I was quite surprised that there weren't any efficient payment methods that would be cost effective enough to make this work. And when I saw that, I was looking 
for new ways to conduct payments in an efficient way. And at, at some point in early 2012, a good friend of mine told me about Bitcoin because he knew that I was interested in financial services in general. And so I looked into it, um, first didn't really know what to think about it. But then as this problem with expensive payments uh, really became an, an obstacle into founding a cross-border lending platform, I thought, okay, let's, let's take a closer look at Bitcoin, this digital currency. Um, <laughs> maybe that, that could help me. And so I literally took three whole days only reading about Bitcoin day and night. And after those three days, I really thought, wow, this is it. This is what I was looking for for a couple of months now. This is the solution to my problem. And then the whole story began. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, I started Bitbond. Uh, and uh, from day one, used Bitcoin for payment processing on our platform. That's uh, that's amazing. This was uh, back in, what, 2013 about? Exactly. So in 2012, the idea was floating around. And then in 2013, early through 2013, the company got founded. Now, how, how, how did you find when you got started, how easy was it to access these different markets, like getting into Brazil and cross-border with all of the different regulations and different languages? Was, uh, was it difficult from the outset? Well, what happened was that we started Bitbond with an English-speaking only interface. Mm -hmm. So the whole UI was English only. And also, we had no marketing budget whatsoever. <laughs> Therefore, we, we could not address potential users proactively from any locations. What, what we did was we went to Bitcoin Talk, for instance, and said, wow, we're launching this great service. Do you want to go and check it out? And then whoever saw that and arrived at Bitbond uh, and signed up uh, was our first user, right? So we, we literally acquired our first users through Bitcoin Talk. Um, some of them we offered, uh, look, if, if, if you're developing a new application, uh, we will test it if you test ours, right? Uh, uh, hmm. There was one guy who back then built, uh, this is a true story, built a Bitcoin wallet for a Windows phone and he couldn't find any test users. And I happened <laughs> to own a, a Windows phone. So I said, look, I, I will test your, your Bitcoin wallet for Windows phone because I have one uh, if you test Bitbond for me. And so this is how the first user has arrived at Bitbond. That's amazing. And so uh, what kind of users ended up using this? Like what kind of, it's for small businesses, but what kind of businesses usually would take out this type of business loan? Correct. So today we have a, a really strong focus on small business owners. But back then, even though the vision from the beginning was to create a service for small business owners, we, we didn't really have a choice. We had to start working with the first users that simply happened to come by. And the first users who actually found our service useful were Bitcoin miners. So the people who were back then privately mining Bitcoin and sort of semi-professional operations um, have used our platform in order to borrow Bitcoins to purchase mining hardware or to purchase mining contracts. And then also on the investor side, um, we had quite a few Bitcoin miners who then wanted to invest those Bitcoins that they created through Bitcoin mining. I mean, back then you didn't have a lot of use cases for Bitcoin. And um, Bitbond was actually a nice way for people who owned Bitcoin and knew something about it to use it in, a, in an exciting way. Hmm. I could imagine that, uh, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that if, uh, if it, back in the day, it would have been difficult to extract Bitcoin from the network. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, how, so how did you manage? It was really purely Bitcoin loans, right? Uh, also, maybe just one remark here. Today, most of the loans are US dollar and, um, uh, and euro denominated. While still all the payment transactions run in Bitcoin, the value is fixed in dollars or in euros. Back then, those were Bitcoin denominated loans only. And so the, also there weren't many use cases outside of funding a Bitcoin mining operation because otherwise the exchange rate risks would have been too high. 
Are you finding that the exchange rate risks are higher now that you're fixed to the U.S. dollar uh, amounts or the euro amounts? Well, what happens is, so let's say you have a U.S. dollar denominated loan. You get your loan amount paid out in Bitcoin. But for most countries uh, where we have many users, we have integrated exchange services. So let's say you want to borrow um, $10,000, then you get Bitcoins paid out um that are worth $10,000 and you will immediately either spend those bitcoins and pay your supplier with it or withdraw it to your bank account in, in which process the bitcoins get converted into your local currency and therefore we help our users to um, effectively avoid exchange rate exposure entirely. I was. We were saying on this podcast a number of times that uh, one of the difficulties uh, that many people using Bitcoin still have is that it's that you actually see the interface, you see the uh, the process in uh, in the settlements and how uh, even though it, the process is simpler uh, using Bitcoin and more straightforward, fewer steps, it the fact that you see it means people think of it as more complicated uh, than going to a bank. And uh, uh, what are your thoughts on on what needs to be done on an interface level for people to to really accept widely the use of Bitcoin for these loan services and this sort of thing. So here is what we have done. Um, we had also the experience that when we highlighted Bitcoin too much, uh, without even trying our service, people found it or perceived it to be as complicated. And and what we have done is we right now we offer two options when you get your loan paid out. We, we ask you to specify a payout method and one method is pay out my loan to my bank account and in that case when the loan gets funded we automatically send the funds to an exchange, convert it into euros let's say if you're from France for example and pay out the loan to your bank account and you don't have to deal with that process at all. The only thing that you see is Got your loan funded, the next day the amount arrives in your bank account. The second option that we offer is pay out via Bitcoin and then what happens is what you simply have the Bitcoins of the loan in your wallet, in your Bitbond account. And therefore the user can choose and we don't tell them, well actually in the background the payments always run through Bitcoin. We don't tell them that. We simply tell them you have two payout options one bank account to Bitcoin and then those users who are not familiar with Bitcoin who don't want to try and understand it take the bank account option the users who know more about it uh, would pick the Bitcoin option and we don't try to explain them what's running under the hood if they want there is enough information online to find that out so we, we're not really hiding it explicitly but also we're not highlighting it uh, in mm. order not to confuse our users it's a tough trade-off, isn't it, uh, between uh, the amount of information that people should receive. Um, but I'm wondering, do, do you feel that it increases people's risk if they uh, if they take the exchange option and become more reliant on the exchange? Well, we work with an exchange that we have integrated, and mm -hmm. we make sure that the processes are really convenient and smooth. So I I wouldn't say that it's adding a lot of risk because also funds are not stored with, with the exchange for a long time. It's always mm. just for one transaction and uh, it, the, the funds arrive in Bitcoin at the exchange and then get paid out immediately. And let's assume in an extreme scenario that this partner exchange that we're working with um, went bankrupt, then everything that would be at risk would be the transactions of one day and mm. um, uh, we would probably even have the financial means to replace those funds for our users um, although they actually own the funds and they take the risk we would probably cover that risk for our users in such a in such a scenario because we just want to offer them the best user experience that's possible and the, the financial risk um, from a company perspective is relatively limited that's there and therefore um, since we sort of 
uh, highly recommend this provider that w w we have integrated, we would also take over that risk for our users. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I wanted to move a little bit toward uh, the theoretical because you're in a position to see some rather interesting things in the industry. And I wanted to know on this topic of uh, exchanges, uh, how important do you think decentralization is to cryptocurrency? Because that's sort of like the ideal that Bitcoin was started with, but we're seeing more and more companies being reliant on exchanges, centralizing. Uh, do you think that we're moving towards more centralization of services? Or do you think that this ideal of decentralized currency uh, is still alive and well? Um, first of all, I think it's still alive and well, and I think that people have a choice, and that's what's important. Um, I, it, to me, it's not a problem that we're seeing more and more centralized services coming up, as long as the underlying protocol remains permissionless and decentralized. So anyone can choose which exchange they want to work together with and if they are not happy with it then they can change it as long as we have low barriers to entry and as long as bitcoin remains permissionless and anybody could start an exchange and and offer exchange services um, therefore i'm not too concerned about these centralized services but what i'm a little bit concerned with is whether the governance of bitcoin is is working well and and whether bitcoin as a as a protocol and as a and as a software project remains as decentral as it can be well uh what do you think the best way forward is because i mean for the listeners that don't know uh, bitcoin has a rather decentralized governance structure right and uh so it's not like there's one person who's say, directing it in a particular direction yes and that's something where I don't even have like a like a fully laid out opinion on <laughs> because on the one hand the way the process works right now it 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 kind of makes sure that extreme changes don't happen and especially don't happen too fast which which in a sense is a strength but then on the other hand when there are changes that perhaps to me and sometimes many others seem like the obvious next step in the technical evolution of Bitcoin and get prevented because there isn't enough consensus, then that's a problem, right? And uh, Are we talking about SegWit? <laughs> for instance, yes. <laughs> for instance. <laughs> and now the, 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 the thing is, how do you want to solve that? And I, 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 don't, have a, I don't have a great proposal on how to solve that. Um, so even though I would want uh, uh, a little bit more progress on the technological evolution of bitcoin it would require a different governance model and here the question would be well what should that governance model look like for a decentral currency and the the, the short answer is i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well do you do you perceive that it uh, the governance right now is become a bit of a power struggle uh do you think the miners maybe have too much power um First of all, yes, it has become a power struggle. Do the miners have too much power? Well, they put up a lot of resources. That's something mm. that we should always consider. They invested heavily into uh, into resources that are application specific, as the name ASIC <laughs> even implies. Right? Mm -hmm. They they cannot just take their hardware and 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 start to uh, mine gold with that. Right? <laughs> so. Um, th th they are tied to this and therefore I think it's fair that they have a certain degree of power. Mm, should they control everything? I don't think that would be great. But uh, to, to a certain degree, I think it's fair that since they invested a lot of resources, they also have a, have a significant say in, in, in the future development of Bitcoin. That does make sense. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation of cryptocurrency? It's a hot topic right now. Everyone is uh, is waiting for uh, for various uh, organizations like the SEC to weigh in on whether the Bitcoin should be classed as a security or as a currency. 
What do you think? So, um, regulation well, easy is a question. Topic. Yeah, easy question. Uh, let me let me answer it quickly. <laughs> um, um, at Bitbond, we are a regulated financial institution in Germany, and we have our own regulatory license under which we operate. And for for, for any company, regulation is typically perceived as a cost because you have to comply with certain standards and some of them you'd pro probably comply anyway because it makes sense from a business perspective with some of the standards you would probably want to avoid because you perceive them as simply cost but no added benefit to the company or the users of the company and um, what needs to be considered though is that uh, Regulation to a certain degree also adds trust with external parties who don't know some companies yet and it might help to work together with more mature companies when when you are a regulated business in general. Um, so th there are costs and there are potential benefits. Um, what's, what's definitely a problem is when you have regulatory uncertainty, which mm. is the case for many countries around the world today. And regulatory uncertainty means that you as a company operate under, under an environment where you don't know whether costs might change from one day to the other if the regulator decides to change the regulation. And also it, 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 it really diminishes trust with potential business partners. And therefore, in the absence of regulation, you definitely have a problem. Now, then the question is how much regulation is is good in germany bitcoin is regulated as a financial instrument and therefore all the regulations apply to bitcoin related companies that also apply to other financial services companies that deal with financial instruments and therefore there is a high degree of regulatory certainty but definitely also a higher level of cost in order to comply with those regulations compared to, com to countries where no regulation is present at all. Um, if, if I had to lay out something like an ideal model for the future, I would, I would be in favor that every regulator around the world um, issues a statement as to how they regulate Bitcoin-related companies and services that are provided around cryptocurrencies and tokens in order to create a regulatory certain environment where everybody knows where they stand from a legal perspective. But at the same time, keep the entry barriers to these markets as low as possible in order to maintain a high level of experimentation and innovation. But this is this is a little bit of cheap talk, of course, because in the details yeah, having is, your cake and eating it too, really. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because also implementing it in the way that I described is a lot more difficult than just saying these things. Mm. Yeah, and that's uh, I mean that's always been the case of uh, when there's more regulation, there's more trust, but at the same time it skews the market toward the big players who have the money and the resources to correct uh, actually create these regulatory compliance structures. I want to shift us uh, into something a little bit more fun before we wrap up. Uh, I want to get your predictions on the future. And uh, no wrong answers with this one. Uh, we're just going to see how it plays out over the next uh, few uh, months. But we are currently recording this on August 23rd, 2017. We're probably going to air in a couple of weeks. But um, I want to look back maybe at the end of the year and see what you thought on a few issues. All right, sure. you ready? Yes. Okay. Bitcoin Cash, up to the moon or down to zero? Um, more down to zero than up to the moon. Really? Yes. Down to zero. Well, why? <laughs> well, if I had to make a choice between those two extremes, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Because I think there's there's only very little transactional value to it, and and that's uh, uh, that's primarily because I don't believe that a lot of liquidity on exchanges will shift to Bitcoin Cash. Um, so obviously the, 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 the utility in doing and, and performing transactions with Bitcoin Cash is the same as with Bitcoin or maybe even higher because of the, the larger blocks. But I don't think a, a lot of real liquidity will shift. And obviously uh, if, if, if you want to have a, a currency, a payment network uh, that, that's actually being used, then you need liquidity 
Um, mm. Because if uh, if no people join the party, then it's a pretty boring party. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Proof of stake versus proof of work. What do you think is going to win in the new ICO projects and token projects going forward? Um, this is probably a question that someone with more in-depth technical knowledge than myself <laughs> could answer in a better way. Um, I have not yet seen proof of stake at work really and therefore it's very hard for me to assess it and therefore I believe that proof of work at least for the next couple of months is, is here to stay. Uh, and of course Ethereum will be the big test environment if, if they make Absolutely. it work and switch to proof of stake then this might something that uh, if it if it works will 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 be a good case and, and a good role model and if it works then probably a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens will switch to proof of stake but I think everybody will be looking very closely at what happens with ethereum and until then until until we have uh, proof of stake uh, working at scale um, proof of work will remain uh, the, the the primary way to build consensus I think that's a legitimate legitimate uh, uh, prediction right there Radoslav I want to thank you for being on the show and uh, best of luck with Bitbond Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it, Nathan. Uh, best of uh, luck with your endeavors and with this podcast. I think it's a great format and I wish you all the best. Thank you for listening to this Analysis in Chains exclusive interview. Well, Nathan, uh, I thought that was a fantastic interview you had. Um, great job. Um, can't wait. To Thank have, you. Can't wait to have more like that in the future. Um, one of the main takeaways I took from that interview was how uh, Radislav used Bitcoin as an application or as a tool to uh, help develop his service because he knew he wanted to provide a service to small businesses. Um, he had some challenges ahead and being introduced to Bitcoin ended up being that eureka moment. He doesn't need to um, hold Bitcoin. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't need to develop blockchain technology. He just uses it as a form of transaction to help send funds abroad. And for me, it was like a eureka moment in terms of how we can use cryptocurrencies as a solution rather than cryptocurrencies and tokens being this this the solution. It's used as a as a tool to uh, develop a business. And uh, I hope Absolutely. I hope it's a eureka moment for many entrepreneurs out there. I think we're going to see a lot more of that sort of thing going forward, uh, especially now that cryptocurrencies are gaining traction in the public awareness. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. So if anyone is interested in getting in touch with us, info at analysisandchains.com. We've got a new website up at info, or sorry, up at www.analysisandchains.com. Uh, people may have noticed it there. We've got a, uh, a new website and the ability to give us your email address. It'll help us keep in touch with you for upcoming events, interesting contests, all sorts of interesting stuff. And if you sign up to our mailing list, then uh, you'll be officially part of our team and we'll reward you with, uh, with 10 of our Nathan and Neil custom tokens, the nutshells. Mm, exciting. And uh, I'd like to take this moment to thank everyone that has actually emailed in. Um, thank you for all of the positive feedback and uh, you know we love hearing from you and um, because this this whole blockchain community that's developing it's uh, it's great to hear other like-minded people out there so keep the emails coming in and uh, we look forward to uh, interacting with you in the future that's our show thanks for tuning in to analysis and chains with nathan and neil check us out at analysisandchains.com on itunes podbean and wherever else you listen to podcasts until next time keep hashing